Hi, everybody, and welcome to Adler Astronomy Live. My name is Meredith, I am your host, and today we're going to be talking about galaxies. So as many of you already know, the Adler Planetarium is currently closed to the public. So we're trying to find some fun ways to bring some of our programming online to you. And if any of you have been in our space before, you might remember our space visualization lab. This is an area of the planetarium where guests can walk in and talk to real live experts about their field of study. And it's really exciting and cool. So we're trying to bring that to you today. We're hoping that you will be able to talk to real live experts. Um, as you can see, we're not in the planetarium. We're just in our own homes. So because of that, you might get some extra bonus features such as some kind of technical difficulty or maybe somebody's child or pet, you know, joining them on their screen or you might hear my neighbors grinding metal. I think that's what they're doing. It sounds like they're just grinding metal. I don't know why. Anyway, for that, we just ask for your patience and understanding and that we hope that you're ready to have some fun and uh, talk to some real live experts. Okay, so with us today, we have some awesome special guests. First, we have Dr. Greg Mosby. Hi, Greg. Hello. How are you? Where are you joining us from? I'm joining you from uh, my apartment in Washington, D.C. Yay, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Greg Mosby is a research astrophysicist and detector scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. His research centers on galaxy evolution studies and near infrared sensors and instrumentation. Thank you so much for joining us, Greg. Also, Greg is just really cool. Uh, also with us, we have our very own Aaron Geller. Hi, Aaron. Hi, everybody. You're joining from north of me, so I'm just gonna wave, this is north. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. Uh, Aaron is, of course, one of our astronomers, and he studies the lives and deaths of stars and planets, but he's interested in all of astronomy and space. Um, also, fun fact, Greg and Aaron went to grad school together at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So this is like a fun reunion. That's right. Yay. Okay. So I think uh, we're pretty much ready to start. I just want to uh, point out that this is meant to be interactive. You'll see that Colleen is joining you in the YouTube chats. Everybody say hi to Colleen. And if you have questions at any point during today's program, just ask them in YouTube chats, utilize that function, and then Colleen will get them over to us. That's what today's program is all about. Okay, I think we are ready to get started. Aaron, let's just take a minute. Can you just explain to everybody uh, why Greg is so important and dare I say instrumental in the field of astronomy? <laughs> I see what you did there with that word instrumental. Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, so astronomers, you can, you know, broadly speaking, you can put us into three different categories. You have the observers who use telescopes and the instruments on telescopes to view the cosmos and figure out all these mysteries. You have theorists who work, you know, possibly in pencil and paper with math equations or on a computer making computer simulations. And they're trying to interpret the observations and make predictions for observations. And then you have people who work on instrumentation like Greg. And people who work with instrumentation are so important because they build the instruments that work on the telescopes that everybody requires in astronomy for their research. So without people like Greg, we just would not have astronomy. And Greg is even more special because not only does he build the instruments, but he also does research. He uses them, observes galaxies, which he'll tell us all about today. Yes, I'm so excited. And let me just say, I've met Greg a couple times now. Really nice guy. It's really exciting when somebody who's just so nice has done something so cool. I like to point those things out. Um, also with us, Aaron, do you want to introduce Mark? Absolutely. We got Mark behind the scenes. Yeah, Mark Subarau, our visualization expert and the director of our space visual visualization group at the Adler is here, you won't see him on camera, but he is going to be controlling all the visuals. And actually he has a slideshow in Worldwide Telescope coming up for us on all these amazing galaxies. And Mark, if you wanna cue that, um, Worldwide Telescope is a software that actually anybody can access online. And you know, don't go there now, but after we're done, go check <laughs> yes. it out, it's great. Yes, Worldwide Telescope is amazing. And we've used it before to uh, make shows at the planetarium, at least one show. Um, okay, let's just start with the basics. Greg, can you just tell us what is a galaxy versus a solar system? Hi, yeah, thanks Meredith and Aaron for those really good introductions. 
Yeah, I really humble by those. <laughs> and, I, and, I'm, and I'm lucky that I get to study galaxies, like some of the things you're seeing right here on the screen. Uh, galaxies are these collections of mass, of gas, dust, and stars, dark matter in the universe. And they're really responsible for essentially taking the gas in the universe and through the star formation, changing that gas into heavier elements, which make up all the things that we see around us in the world today. You know, the cold gas is what's primarily responsible for the star formation, like these little blue spots that you're seeing in the images in those spiral arms. Uh, and that collapsing of that cold gas into stars is what you know transforms our universe. Now, as we've seen through the slideshow, galaxies will come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Some look like the spiral galaxies, like the Milky Way. Some look like this kind of big globular thing, which is like an elliptical galaxy. And something that's really interesting is that it seems like all really big galaxies seem to have a black hole in the center of the galaxy. Uh, and these black holes, holes can sometimes eject jets, like one of the ones you're seeing now. Uh, so, you know, when you go out and look at the sky, uh, you look at stars, they're really far away. You look at maybe a galaxy and everything seems kind of static and unchanging on the sky. Uh, mm -hmm. But in actuality, these things are transforming, they're changing. Uh, and our galaxy itself is going to go to a pretty big transformation in you know, a few billion years. And that's because the Andromeda galaxy, one of the galaxies we're seeing here, is actually going to run right into the Milky Way. There's going to be an ongoing collision. Now, Andromeda is special in another way because it's actually one of the few galaxies that, you know, if you're in a dark location, you can actually see Andromeda uh, with the naked eye. Have you all seen Andromeda with your naked eye before? I have, absolutely. And it's an interesting story because it ties me in with Greg as well, because the first time that I saw this, saw Andromeda, was when I was in a state park in Wisconsin. And this was part of a program that we used to do, and I think it's still going on at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, called Universe in the Park, where we would take telescopes to state parks all around Wisconsin and, sh and let anyone who was there look out of the telescopes and we'd tell them about all the things that were up in the sky. And I saw Andromeda for the first time there and it was like an amazing, like wow experience for me. I mean, it's a, it's a fuzzy thing on the sky. It's kind of, you know, hard to see, but it's two and a half million light years away. It's the farthest thing that you can see with your naked eye. Uh, and in case you all want to try to find that, it, Andromeda is actually up at night now in the Northern hemisphere. It's up uh, roughly between August and December um, so you can try to go outside and see it, but you need to go to a place that's dark, away from city lights, and probably you want a, a time of day of, of the year, of the night, where there's no big moon in the sky. Um, and you can get there from star hopping from the constellation Cassiopeia. There's a lot of great websites that'll show you how to find it. So cool. I've seen it too, and you're right. It's just a tiny smudge, and I can't see it in Chicago. What about, <laughs> what about you, Greg? Yeah, like my, my first experience of actually, you know, seeing Andromeda uh, was actually at a planetarium. Uh, as a graduate student in Wisconsin, uh, when we were teaching the astronomy uh, courses as teaching assistants, we had to do a planetarium show. So I spent a, a, few, a few hours and nights in a planetarium just preparing a show. Uh, and so you could kind of change the time of the year, the day, you could change like the background lighting. And so I was actually able to simulate like a really dark sky in the planetarium and pick out in my eye where Andromeda was. And yeah, it's like this little little smudge there. It's a, you know, my first experience at looking at Andromeda was also at the UW. So cool. Okay, we have a lot of questions coming in. A lot of people want to return to the part about us colliding with Andromeda, which makes sense. We've got a lot of questions about that. Um, but really quick, we have two questions. Uh, first from Marlene, who wants to know, what is dust? When we talk about dust, what is that? Ah, that's a good question. So dust is almost exactly what you're thinking about. Uh, they're like these little tiny particles of material. Uh, and our universe is not just, you know, gas and stars, kind of like that the concrete things you often think of, there's actually tiny particles uh, of small elements like, you know, made of carbonaceous, like kind of like grains that are kind of on the micron or submicron scale that are kind of floating around in the universe. So it really is kind of like little dust particles. Yes, and there's enough of it to create planets, correct? 
Yeah, yeah, no, these dust particles often accumulate uh, and conglomerate to form what we call planetesimals, and then those things collide and stick together, form bigger things, and things can just build up from there. Okay, and now we have another question from somebody named Alice who wants to know what percentage of the matter in the universe is a galaxy? Big question. Oh. So that, that is an interesting question. It's, it's kind of tricky because like I, I was saying in the beginning, galaxies are made of, of the stuff that we see, like okay. what we scientists often call baryonic matter, but huh. there's also dark matter in galaxies, which is the matter that we don't see. Uh, so if you include the dark matter and the baryonic matter that we see, a large fraction of the universe is in these, it's in these galaxies. If you don't include the dark matter, and just include the baryonic matter, uh, it's a smaller fraction. And that's kind of why we had to come up with the idea of dark matter in the first place. We had to figure out where, where the extra gravity that we see around galaxies, where the extra material in the universe is. Incredible. So there's a lot of mysteries still out there. OK, let's, let's go back to talking about colliding, because I think we're all feeling a little scared. Uh, <laughs> Emily Hayhoe wants to know what will happen when they do collide. And also King Dar Darius 2100 wants to know what are the chances of two stars colliding when they collide? These are all questions that I have as well. So if you could just, you know, kind of please discuss. <laughs> Yeah, this may be a good time to run the video. Yes. Yeah, do you want me to just give a quick introduction to this video that we're watching? We are watching a, a visualization of a computer model of the Milky Way and Andromeda collision. And this was developed with a collaboration between NASA scientists and folks at the Advanced Visualization Lab, just a little south of us at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And this is a great example of how you can take really detailed simulations and turn them into really beautiful visuals to help explain uh, stories in astronomy. This is a collision that's going to happen in four and a half billion years from now. And I'm going to let Greg actually take over and kind of explain some of this more science behind this. Yeah, so we think galaxy merges are a very important part about how galaxies form and, if, and kind of how they transform with time. And what happens is that two galaxies, kind of like the spiral galaxies of the Milky Way and Andromeda, can combine to form something that looks completely different than what we ex with the, both galaxies were beforehand. Uh, and this is because in this collision, the collision drives lots of star formation. Lots of cold gas gets turned into stars. These collisions, just because of the gravity and how things interact, also will funnel gas and dust into the black holes in these galaxies, which can further eject out gas uh, from the galaxy, shutting down star formation in the galaxy. The combination of like, vigorous star formation, using up the gas, uh, outflows from the star formation, outflows from a black hole e accreting the gas and dust in the galaxies, all work together to essentially shut off star formation. And so these really big, beautiful blue spiral galaxies that had lots of young stars in them uh, age and die, and no new stars are born. So the galaxies end up kind of these big spheroidal spear balls of older population stars that look red. And so you get this big transformation from these big, beautiful spirals to these uh, kind of, not boring, but kind of this globular, uh, spherical, uniform looking elliptical galaxies. Okay, and, so yep. we, we need these collisions, in other words. Yeah, this is, this is how material gets churned and turned into different things in our universe. And this is how big galaxies get formed through these mergers. So, so cool. And so yeah. I guess I was gonna say, Eric could speak to a little bit to how the star collisions work. Like in these collisions, stars are actually still really far apart. We see them in the simulation that looks really nice because they, they're kind of these small particles, but most of the stars are often really far apart. So the chance of a stellar stellar collision is actually quite small. Yeah, that's right. And and I personally, I love studying star collisions. This is actually part of the research that I do. But that, as you said, Greg, that doesn't usually happen when two galaxies collide. It can actually happen in our own galaxy in a smaller scale in star clusters where stars are actually very densely packed together and they can just run into each other because of gravity. Um, but like you said, Greg, that when, when the uh, Milky Way and Andromeda collide, we don't really expect the stars themselves to collide because of that, that uh, interaction. What we do expect though is the gas to kind of bump into each other and run into each other. 
And that may trigger a little bit of extra star formation when the gas compresses. Um, and then of course, over time, the gas goes away. And, and like you were saying, Greg, we run out of new stars being born. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we have a question from Jeff Greenspan and I'm gonna say it slowly because there's big words in it. All right, which occurs first? Red star formation that is characteristic of elliptical galaxies or the ellipticization of the <laughs> galaxy? <laughs> oh, this, this, is a, this is a neat question. Because uh, you're essentially asking about the, the time scale of the stars, essentially the young stars dying off and the older populations of stars starting to dominate the light. So young stars typically live several millions of years. Uh, and then once they're gone, that's when a galaxy's color starts to turn red. And so you start to see mostly red stars. Uh, now, as a galaxy merges together, that time scale is usually on the order of billions of years. Because so these merges can take quite some time, uh, and like human time stand, <laughs> time frame. So that can take quite some time for the galaxies to completely merge and form something that looks spheroidal and like an elliptical galaxy. Okay, so we have a really long time until our galaxy collides with Andromeda. And even after that happens, it could take a really long time to actually complete. So we're good. We shouldn't feel scared right now, correct? Mm -hmm. um, okay, Emily Hayhoe has a question. It's the big question. I feel this to me is like the big question. And Emily, you're apologizing for being new to astronomy. No need to apologize. This is a question on everyone's mind. What is dark matter? <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great question. Uh, lots of scientists and physicists have that exact question. What is dark matter? Uh, so far in our investigations of trying to figure out what, what this extra you know, gravity or mat material is coming from have only wound up with answers of what it's not. Uh, okay. And so it's an active area of research. So that's, that's a great question. It's a huge research topic in astronomy right now. Lots of scientists are working to try to figure out what is dark matter. Big question, Emily, and good question. Um, Christopher Adams wants to know, and this is a question I had for you the other day. <laughs> so I'm right there with you, Christopher. If a star system is ejected from its parent galaxy due to the collision, would life on any planets orbiting that star notice a material difference? I had that question too. I was like, would we be okay? Would we follow yeah. our star? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You would notice uh, quite a big of a difference. Uh, we, since this hasn't happened, happened yet, or at least that's happened to us. We can't really say exactly uh, what, what the conditions for life would be, but uh, being ejected from your galaxy would have a, a very big impact on, on, you, on a, a, a planet around the star. Uh, and just how big of impact would depend on lots of the, the physics uh, of you know, whether the planet can still withstand life throughout that process. Yeah, if I can add to that. So if you imagine a scenario where the sun and all of our planets just kind of migrate slowly out of the galaxy and the planets are still orbiting in the same distance from the sun, uh, then that's, and the sun is still alive, uh, that is fine. And, and we wouldn't notice like a big temperature change or anything on earth. Of course, our night sky would look much different because we wouldn't see all these stars from our galaxy, which is what, you know, what we see as our constellations. Um, but if something happened where, you know, this star, our solar system was ejected and something happened that caused like the Earth's orbit to change, for instance, that could be terrible for us because then the temperature on Earth would change or we might collide with another planet or something. Um, as long as we're talking about these doomsday scenarios, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the timing of this Andromeda and Milky Way collision is actually interesting because it's also around the same time that our sun will run out of the hydrogen fuel in its core and start changing really rapidly and just get much, much bigger. It'll turn into a red giant, that's what we call it. And so uh, if you know people are still around, that'll be a time for us to go somewhere else. Okay. <laughs> Cool. So, and we know that date, we're ready to plan for it. It's not going to be a surprise. <laughs> Great. Okay. We'll put it in our calendars. Um, <laughs> all right. So we have a really cool visualization that I think we should look at just since we're talking about merging galaxies and what that looks like. Uh, I don't know, Aaron, you want to talk about this? Yeah, this is a really fun one that Mark Subarau developed and he's showing it right now. What you're looking at is a, this is a computer model now, and we're going to collide two galaxies. And we can change how these 
galaxies look and how the collision is going to happen. You saw Mark changing the sizes. He can change the orientation. He can change the speed. And when he's ready, he'll run the collision. And this is, for those of you who really like the technical side of things, this is interesting from the technical side because it's the computer is calculating the force of gravity in between all these stars in the center of the galaxies and visualizing it at the same time. So you've got like hundreds of thousands of particles. So technically it's really challenging and visually it's beautiful and you just have all these options to play with. And, and this is the, these are the types of simulations that astronomers would use to try to understand some of the images that we get of all these strange collision products of galaxies. And so cool. I think this is awesome. And let me ask those of you who are watching this, if you like this, and you think that, hey, I'd like to play around with this myself. Um, we could potentially make this tool available online in some format for you to play around with all these knobs that you can turn and you can press play and watch it go however many times you want. If this seems fun to you and you want us to do that, type that in the chat, tell us that we want to do that or get in touch with us on email. And if enough of you want it, we will make it. Yes, basically what Aaron's saying is we all love this tool. It's so fun and we want to share it with the world, but we just, want to know if you would actually use it. You, do you like it? I'll bet. I'll bet some people. You know what? All we need is one person. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> uh, okay. So this is awesome. We're having so much fun. If anybody is just now joining us, uh, this is Adler Astronomy Live. My name is Meredith. We've got Greg. We've got Aaron. We're talking about galaxies. Uh, you, you are meant to ask us questions. So please type in the YouTube chat. Ask us your questions. Also, this is our time to talk about the fact that the Adler Planetarium is currently closed. Um, so we are uh, putting out a call for donations. If you are able to donate, we appreciate it so much. Any amount is welcome. Maybe you want to donate, mm, I don't know, $4.5 billion uh, for the number of years until the Milky Way collides with the Andromeda, or maybe just $400 for the number of billions of stars in our galaxy, or maybe just $1 for the number of direct images of a black hole, the M87. <laughs> so any amount is welcome. No amount is ever too small. We are so appreciative. It really helps us to keep programs like this going while we are currently closed to the public because of COVID. Um, remember that? Okay, cool. So let's get back to our program. Greg, we're gonna talk a little bit about your instruments. Let's uh, talk about your work with microgravity. And also I heard a little something about you and the vomit comet. Can we talk about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is, this is actually something that's really fun. I've always been interested in, you know, being in the lab and tinkering with my hands. So in college, I got involved with this group uh, that built and designed experiments to be flown on the Vomit Comet. Uh, so we got a chance to go down to Houston, uh, show off our experiments. And I was one of the lucky guys that actually got to go and ride in microgravity. And I think we have a video here of me doing some, you know, some zero G. Oh, nice, Greg. Um, yeah. So, yeah. We, uh, it was a really fun experience because we got to, you know, actually write a proposal for what type of science experiment we would do in zero G. Uh, and then we had to go in, you know, make the argument that we were ready to, you know, run our experiment uh, on an airplane. And that really, you know, like drove my interest in, you know, being involved in building things, doing experimental work. So cool. Can you explain really quick how that vomit comet works? How did you float and spin? Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. So what the, uh, the vomit comet does is it, it takes this plane on these ballistic kind of parabolic trajectories uh, and near the top of the parabola, because the plane is in free fall, uh, you don't experience what we call weight you know, you don't experience gravity. So you're weightless. Uh, and so for those 30 seconds at the top of the parabola, you're weightless and you can do experiments in uh, microgravity. Was your heart racing during this? Yeah, it, it, was, it was very fun, uh, very exhilarating. Uh, they, give you, they give you medication so that your inner ear uh, and your, you know, your, your, your body's balance system is kind of turned off so that you don't get nauseous or get disoriented. Uh, but occasionally people do still get a little bit of nauseous, nausea and, you know, going into weightlessness. I was one of the lucky few. I didn't have any side effects. It was just fun. 
nice. I could use that medication when I take CTA buses sometimes. Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. Hence the name Vomit Comet, right? I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about your work with telescopes. Tell us, tell us scope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like I said, I was always interested in kind of tinkering. And so I eventually combined those interests into working on astronomy instrumentation. So this is where we build, you know, instruments for telescopes. I got a chance as a graduate student to work with the Wind Telescope, which is shown on the screen right now. Uh, it's out in Kitt Peak, Arizona. Uh, there are some of the other telescopes on Wind. You get a view of the whole mountain. I also got an opportunity to work on the Southern African Large Telescope, also known as SALT, which is in South Africa, uh, where I worked on an instrument that we were putting together uh, that was at Wisconsin for my PhD. In particular, I worked on actually analyzing the sensors that we're gonna use to uh, put in our instrument for the telescope. Now, now these sensors that I, I work on and started working on in graduate school are kind of these semiconductor devices that we use to take snapshots of the sky. They're what we use to take the pictures of the sky that we then go back into our labs and analyze. And here's a picture of me right here in graduate school, looking at some of the, the sensor data uh, that was taken in the lab. And I actually spent a lot of time in that room where we were trying to run our sensor and test it and make sure everything was working okay. Wow, you know, one of my favorite stories about building telescopes, which I don't, I, there probably aren't a ton, but um, one of my favorites is uh, when William Herschel was building his telescope, the Herschel telescope, he was grinding the lens and like would not take his eyes off of the lens as he was grinding it for hours and hours and hours. And his sister Caroline, who also helped him to make all of his incredible discoveries uh, and made discoveries herself, uh, she ended up spoon feeding him porridge so that he didn't have to stop grinding the lens. Do you feel like you kind of relate to that in a way? <laughs> well, yeah, I, ne I never had to have anybody come and spoon feed me porridge uh, in the lab or while I was working on <laughs> looking at our, our sensors. Uh, but I can definitely relate to the, the, uh, the kind of intensity <laughs> of the scenario. Like, so in that room that we showed in the picture, uh, yeah, I had to spend a lot of time in there, but we also had to run this, this almost ancient piece of equipment, not ancient, but it was, it was from the 60s. It was older than I was at the time uh, that we were using to cool down our sensor and what the sensor was inside of. Uh, and because it was like a refrigeration unit, it needed the room, it was heating up the room, uh, but the room still needed to be cold or else we couldn't get down to a good, good temperature. So we had to crank the AC way up uh, in this little, uh, section of the lab. And so I will often be freezing like a popsicle in the lab as I like spent all my time in there. Uh, and when I walked out, be grateful for, you know, sunlight and <laughs> getting warm. Oh my goodness, you're just cold all the time. <laughs> That's so intense. Um, okay, we, real quick, we have some really fun questions that are coming in kind of related to some of the stuff we were talking about before. Charlie Gamblin wants to know, have we been able to observe galactic, galactic collisions or are the models produced purely theoretical? Ah, that's a great question. Yeah, like we, we observe them all the time. Like this is one of the cool things about taking pictures of the sky and having like a really wide field of view. Uh, you can actually look and see galaxy mergers happening right now, like in process, because we get these snapshots in time. Uh, one really good example is like the antennae galaxies. They kind of look like two antennae. Uh, yeah, so we, we observe these mergers in process. And like uh, we were explaining with the simulation video, you can actually, because it's a simulation that you created it, you can like orient your simulation from different points of view and match up how those merging galaxies in your simulation match up to real images uh, that we observe and take of the sky. So cool. So that brings us back to our question. Would you all want to play with our galaxy collision simulation if we put it online? Yes or no? Um, also, Kayla McCarthy has a question, which I'm so interested to know the answer, about the Vomit Comet. Where do these planes fly? Like, where oh, is well, the Vomit Comet happening? Well, yes. Back, back in the day when I did this, and things may be different now, uh, they actually took off from you know Galveston or Houston, Texas, uh, and they would actually fly the parabolas over the Gulf of Mexico. So it was kind of fun. 
it was really interesting. I actually got a chance to look out the cockpit window while we were doing some of the parabolas. Uh, and because, you know, the, the plane is alternating between going up to the sky and taking those dives toward the Gulf, it was a really clear day and you could actually look out and you could not tell where the horizon was because it was just blue sky, then blue water, <laughs> and then blue sky. It, it was a very, very uh, kind of like trippy experience, not actually seeing like a horizon. I would be so scared. Uh, planes are already a little scary to me. Um, okay, so this question kind of helps us dive into some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about with your telescopes and everything. Uh, this is from Stephen Schreier. I hope I pronounced that right. Does the increase in low orbit communication satellites make it make astronomical observations more difficult? Uh, and what about the many pieces of orbiting space debris? And also, um, Stephen just wants to know more in general about telescopes, like optical telescopes versus satellites. Um, and I know we're going to talk about that. So uh, yeah, what are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, like the increasing amount of things that are, you know, orbiting Earth is a challenge because we would really like to get our telescopes in space above Earth's atmosphere because that's where, at least when you're doing optical and infrared astronomy, you, you like to be because you don't have to worry about going through the transmission and the atmosphere. Uh, so it's a challenge. Having more stuff up there is going to make having space satellites up there more difficult. You have to have more planning uh, or different orbits. You have to have a very specific orbit to have something that works. Now, in regards to all the different wavelengths of telescopes, I mean, nowadays in astronomy and in most science, we want everything. We want to make sure we have a full complement of all the different types of telescopes, not one better than the other. We'd like to look at galaxies and radio wavelengths. We like to look at galaxies, which, which are really, really long wavelengths. We like to look at galaxies in the optical and infrared where we can see the stars. We like to look at the galaxies in the X-ray where we see like the really hot gas. Uh, and we like to see gamma rays where we these are these really intense uh, bursts of energy, maybe from emerging stars. Uh, and then, then there's these uh, new things that we haven't really touched on, I won't touch on much of, are gravity waves, which is kind of another game changer way to look at the universe. Uh, to really get a full picture, you kind of want to look at things at all wavelengths. So there's no one method that's necessarily better than the other. Can I touch on the start of the question too, um, about satellites being in the sky? And so Greg, you answer this great with uh, how it is it makes it more difficult to figure out where to put our telescopes, how to launch, when to launch. Um, but there's even another piece too that I'm, I'm guessing Stephen's also interested in, in that because this has been in the press a lot, the um, various companies that want to put satellites to beam internet back down and have constellations of satellites around, this is definitely a concern in astronomy for how it's going to impact the telescope images, ground-based telescope images. So. For instance, a new telescope that's coming up, LSST, now known as the Vera Rubin Telescope, um, that is going to be in Chile and you know looking at the sky and taking images. And, and all these satellites may really make it difficult to take those images. And that's all I want to say about this now, but I want to plug that we maybe have a show related to this coming up soon or in the next season. So stay tuned for that. Ooh, I love that, Aaron. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Nancy Grace Roman. Aaron, why don't you tell us about Nancy Grace Roman, the person, first of all? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so Nancy Grace Roman was an astronomer, an American astronomer, and she actually got her PhD from the University of Chicago, so very nearby to where we are here. She became the first female executive at NASA and served as NASA's first chief of astronomy throughout the 60s and 70s. So she's had a huge impact on the field. And you know, for that reason, NASA's naming a telescope after her. And the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, you might have also heard the term W first. That was the original name, and now it will be known as uh, Nancy Grace Roman. The telescope is scheduled to launch sometime in the mid-2020s. So it'll be the next large telescope after the James Webb Telescope. And what is really amazing about this is it has a field of view that's about 100 times larger than Hubble's. So you might be used to seeing these amazing images from Hubble. And a lot of times that's like a mosaic of many individual pointings from Hubble. Uh, and the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope will be able to do this, take pictures of the sky 100 times larger than Hubble, 
with a similar resolution. Yeah. Um, just quickly, the and so here you're looking at the field of view comparison. So isn't this amazing? Yes, it's blowing my mind. So the general kind of astronomy that the telescope is going to do, and we'll get into a little bit more later, uh, it has kind of three different buckets. It's going to be cosmology, so expansion of the universe and the evolution of dark energy by taking images of billions of galaxies and tracking how they change with time. Then there's going to be a bit of work on exoplanets, which is my personal favorite of, of the science. I think that's going to come out of it. Uh, exoplanets through microlensing and, and a little bit of direct imaging to try to understand the broad characteristics of exoplanets in our galaxy. And then the other third is going to be general astrophysics. So anything from the solar system, like asteroids in our solar system, to star formation, which I'm also interested in, uh, and you know other science that you can do with faraway galaxies, which I know Greg is also really interested in. Yeah, Greg, tell us about your connection with the Nancy Grace Roman. Yeah, so I'm a uh, detector scientist on the Roman team. And so I am responsible for making sure that we kind of test our sensors and making sure that our sensors perform the way they should as we produce them and to make sure we're using them in the best way possible. Uh, all these sensors that you saw in that big mosaic are part of what we call the wide field instrument, WFI. And a WFI is gonna be the main imager for the W first mission. And it has just this 18 of these sensors uh, across the whole field of view. Uh, and those are what we're gonna be using to do the really neat science that uh, Aaron just uh, explained. And these sensors are really sensitive. So we have to be careful and work with them in really controlled environments in the, what we call clean rooms. I love the juxtaposition between these sensors, which are gonna help us look at the universe on such a macro level and how you have to be so aware of like the microorganisms that could potentially get in the way of making these instruments work. Can you tell us about what it's like to work in a clean room? Yeah, no, so yeah, working with these sensors, you have to be in the clean room because they're very sensitive to any sort of electrical discharge, any sort of static electricity. Uh, so often you have to suit up. Uh, if it's a really clean area, you have to suit up in what we call bunny suits. If it's kind of a, somewhere in between, you wear like a nice ESD jacket, put like on a, a head a head garment, head cover, uh, a beard cover for people who have beards like me. Uh, and you also have to wear gloves, of course, because you want to make sure that you're not, you know, getting fingerprints on any of the very sensitive optical equipment. It's, it's really important that in the clean room, you don't have little tiny dust particles that could land on your sensor and affect this imaging quality or to cause potential electrical shorts to kind of destroy the sensor. This is so cool. And this is, you know, thinking about microorganisms and stuff it is on the whole world's mind because of COVID right now. Um, so, but this is something you've been thinking about a lot all the time and, and you know, making sure that you're protected and protecting those around you and the items around you. Uh, so what is your work like right now with COVID? Yeah, because of the, the current pandemic, uh, of course, we're all on telework now, mandatory telework. Uh, the only exception is that, you know, to keep the mission moving forward, uh, there are people who are absolutely critical to the mission who are allowed to go on center. Uh, but the only way they can go on center if there's, is if we we know they can do it safely. So everyone, when they visit center, uh, has to pass through some screening, and they also have to wear face masks. And of course, in the clean room, since you're already doubly protected, you know things follow the normal clean room procedures. Wow. So, my, okay. Myself personally, I'm not one of the ones that have to absolutely be right there in the clean room on the sensors. So I can still do some of my work remotely. Uh, we essentially, you know, post the data, and I can kind of get to it through our, you know, firewalls and servers, and that still analyze the data. Awesome. All right, so Nancy Grace Roman, we're getting pumped for it. What are you most interested in learning or gathering from the Nancy Grace Roman? The, the things that I'm really excited about are the looks that we're gonna get of galaxies at farther away times than what we have now. So because uh, Roman is gonna have these infrared wavelengths, we'll be looking really far back in the, the history of the universe at a particularly interesting time where we think you know, star formation and galaxy formation was maybe peaking. 
in the universe. So that's what I'm really looking forward to. So cool. Okay, we do have a bunch of questions coming in. Um, a lot of these are from Jeff. Jeff, you seem like a really smart and knowledgeable person just from reading your questions. Um, okay, when two galaxies merge and before their SMBHs merge, do I know what an SMBH is? Ah, uh, supermassive black hole. Oh, cool. Okay, how can the galaxy remain stable with two supermassive black holes far apart? Oh, that's a good question. So the black holes are like point masses. So as long as the orbital parameters are favorable for the two black holes to orbit each other and eventually, you know, spin into each other through just some sort of dynamical friction or other forces, things, things will be just fine. Uh, the other stars are essentially will be orbiting around that combined mass like it was just kind of maybe one object. Uh, but the tricky part is sometimes the orbital dynamics aren't that favorable and you can have uh, in a merger, one of the black holes get kicked out. Uh, there are people who study kind of the dynamics of what the black holes do in these mergers and whether you have things all coming together or whether one black hole just kicks out and goes streaming off into <laughs> the universe. <Yeah. laughs> um, amazing. Jeff has a lot of awesome questions. Let me really quick go back though. So we're you would like to study kind of early galaxy formations, but I have a question, which is just for the general public <laughs> and myself. Um, how do you see back in time? How, because that's basically what you're describing. Yeah, no, that, that, that's exactly right. Well, so we, we know that the speed of light is finite. Uh, and what this means is that however, when we look at the night sky and look at galaxies or stars, we're not seeing them right now. We're seeing them at the time the light was emitted. So objects that are billions of years away, we're actually seeing them as they were billions, billions of light years away. We're seeing them billions of years ago. Uh, and so because light takes time to travel, when we look at the night sky, we're not seeing it as it is now. We're actually seeing it on this little delay, however long it takes, long it takes the light to get to us. And so that's how we can, are looking kind of in the history of the universe. So cool. Okay, and so now if you wanna study the birth rate of stars and like star for, formation and everything, how do you do that? Cause that takes billions of years. You can't sit and watch it. No, that's, a, that, that's exactly right. Uh, we do this process that we call stellar population modeling. You know, the cool thing about stars is that as stars age, they change colors. As a group of stars age, they change colors. And that's because some of the young stars die off uh, and the older and younger, the older populations that are redder uh, become more prominent. And so we can kind of figure out how old all of the stars are in the galaxy by looking at all the total light from a galaxy. And we just try to sort all that light that we get from our telescopes and instruments into these different groups and try to reconstruct the history uh, of a galaxy. Now, the analogy I like to use is, let's imagine that you could take a snapshot of everyone on Earth right now, like through a little picture. And somehow through movie magic uh, or any other type of magic that you're, you're interested in, you're able to count up everybody at every interesting age. So let's say you figure out how many 33-year-olds there are on Earth right now, mm -hmm. uh, and let's say it's 120 million. You now know that 33 years ago, 120 million people were born. You can do the same thing for any other age. Like say you go to 10 years old, count up all the 10-year-old, and say, hey, there were 140 million 10-year-olds. So you can say, hey, 10 years ago, 140 million people were born. And you can do that for every age and essentially reconstruct the population growth of the Earth. And that, that's essentially what we're trying to do with galaxies. We're looking at all the light we get from galaxies, trying to sort it up into these different age groups and reconstruct the growth history of the galaxy. That's incredible. Okay, and Aaron, you study stars being born and, and you know, forming and, and anyway, how is this related to <laughs> what you do? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks, Meredith, that's exactly right. And this is one of the, the interesting things about astronomy is how even though Greg and I, our research is different because Greg studies galaxies, big galaxies. I study small scale things like stars. 
uh, they're still connected. So I study how one individual star might change over time, sometimes with telescopes and sometimes with computer models. And those type of small scale studies are required to understand how now a billion stars might change because you have to add up all those individual stars. So you need to know each individual star, how they would change. So cool. So you're in different fields, kind of, but very much connected. Um, okay, so we are running low on time, but I do want to talk about your telescope's SALT, Keck, uh, and, and what you're doing. Uh, so Greg, can you just tell us about that? Yeah, so I use a, a variety of telescopes to do the sort of science I'm interested in. I've worked with the Keck telescope data before. These, these are the telescopes out in Hawaii at 10 meters. Uh, ground-based telescopes. I've also worked with data from the SALT telescope uh, to look at these galaxies that are undergoing these transformations that we're talking about. Uh, but I'm most excited about starting to work with data from telescopes in space. Uh, I've actually was a part of a team that got some Hubble time uh, coming up soon. Uh, and also, I can't wait for JWST and Roman to be available for use because being above the Earth's atmosphere, we'll be able to get some quality uh, optical and infrared data on these types of galaxies. So cool. And if anybody was tuning in last week, we were talking to some uh, experts about how hard it is to apply for time to use telescopes. Greg, do you get special privileges because you work on the telescopes? Ah, that, that's a really good question. Yeah, in, in certain instances, when you're a PI, you're the person responsible for building an instrument or delivering an instrument, you often get sort of as an in-kind uh, gesture uh, time or, you know, kind of first dibs on time on a telescope to use your instrument because you're the person who knows how it works and they want you to check it out doing what we call commissioning to essentially figure out and make sure everything is running okay. Um, amazing. I love this. We are pretty much out of, there's so many questions here. There's so many good questions. Can I ask one more? Okay, let me ask one more. Um, okay, uh, first of all, somebody just wants to know how many galaxies are there, out there, in the universe? Wow, that's, it's hundreds of billions, it's lots. Lots and lots of galaxies out there to study, and some of them are merging. Some of them, you know, uh, are just now forming. So much to look into. Um, okay, do oh, man Jeff Greenspan and Stephen Schreier have so many amazing questions. If we don't get to all your questions, Stephen and Jeff, which I know we're not going to, please email Ask Adler. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second, but I do want to just ask kind of for our closing discussion, Greg, it's just in the next five-ish, maybe 10 years, what is your like number one goal or what would you like to see happen or what project would you like to be involved in? Tell us. Yeah, so like I, I'm really, really anxious to see what James Webb does because that's going to be a really cool and, and you know, foundational instrument for infrared astronomy. Uh, and if I just even thinking past that or beyond that, I'm just really excited to see a new generation of scientists. Like maybe there's some budding scientists that are out there uh, looking at this video right now. I'm interested to see what types of problems they solve because we need all of those little little kids that are looking at this now to like grow up and solve all these mysteries of the universe. You know, uh, especially kids that may look like me or my nieces and nephews. I'm really excited to see what the future generation of scientists will kind of uncover about our universe. I love this and so inspiring. And it's also so great to talk to folks like you, Aaron, and you, Greg, who, you know, sometimes when little kids think about space, they just think about astronauts and actually physically going there. But how many people uh, are so necessary to the amazing discoveries and what we know about space? Um, and also just, you know, Thank you for putting in all those hours being freezing cold in a room working <laughs> with these instruments uh, so that we can make these incredible discoveries. Awesome. It was so nice to talk to you today, Greg and Aaron. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, thank you all for joining. Like I said, I saw that there were so many amazing questions coming in and I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to them all, but please email askadler at adlerplanetarium.org. Colleen is going to put that in the chats too. Um, for real. Oh, you can also tweet at askadler, uh, hashtag askadler at adlerplanet on Twitter. Um, our astronomers for real will answer your emails. I, I see it happening all the time. Uh, astronomers talking about like, hey, who wants to answer this one? It's the easiest way to actually talk to somebody who is just incredibly smart and an expert in their field. It's really cool. That's what, you know, we kind of pride ourselves on at the Adler. Um, and speaking of which, if you enjoyed this program and you want to see more of it and you want to talk to experts more, we appreciate any donation you're able to give. Colleen is going to share that as well. Again, uh, the link to donate. Uh, it helps us a lot, especially since we're closed right now. And we want to bring you more programs like this. And then also, Colleen is going to be sharing a little survey about this program. We want to hear from you and know what would you like to see more of? What are you enjoying? We would love to hear from you. So please fill out that survey. Thank you all so much, Greg, Aaron. Thank you so much for being here. And we'll be back in two weeks. So we'll see everybody in two weeks. Aaron, it was such a pleasure. Thanks. Greg, Bye, everybody. Thank so you. awesome. And Mark, of course, behind the scenes. Thank you. See Thanks. you in two weeks.